Hello, today is July 10th, 2020. My name is Dana Yark. I'm interviewing Betsy Salgado for the Latino Oral History Project, Voces of a Pandemic Project at the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know Ms. Salgado that this interview will be placed in the Northern Illinois University Libraries and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Okay. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are several questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. The Center for Latino and Latin American Studies wishes to archive your interview, along with any other photographs and other documentation, at the Northern Illinois University Libraries. Northern Illinois University Libraries will retain copyright of the interview and any, and any other materials you donate to the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. Do you give the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Northern Illinois University Libraries? Yes, I agree. Do you grant Northern Illinois University Libraries right, title, and interest in your copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow Northern Illinois University Libraries to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to share your interview and your materials with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voces of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? Yes, I agree. We have many questions in a pre-interview form that we have already filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Voces server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before Voces sends it to the Benson Library and NIU libraries, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library and NIU libraries. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson and NIU libraries? Yes, I agree. On occasion, the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies and Voces receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you get consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Okay, great. So we got that out of the way. So let's get into this. First of all, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who is Betsy Salgado? <laughs> um, so I am 24 years old, um, born in Mexico, and I was raised in Chicago all my life. I am a recent graduate from Northern Illinois University, where I got my Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, and I'm also a new graduate nurse. Um, I have, I love cats. I have a pet cat named Mimo. I have a younger sister, and I have another brother, and I like to say that I'm very family-oriented, like my family is very important. I honestly feel like I spend a lot of my time with my family all the time and I'm always like willing to help them out um, especially my mom and my dad my siblings and I think I have a really good relationship with all of them um, during my free time on my days off from work I like to you know obviously sleep in and rest get my get my rest, feel rested for another day of work. I like to run errands and do chores, hop around the house. Um, but I also like to watch movies, documentaries. Um, I grew up reading a lot, like fiction, nonfiction, um, Japanese comics as well. And yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about your 
role on the front lines of a, as a nurse during COVID. Um, maybe we should start with your previous stint as a certified nursing assistant. Mm -hmm. you were, were you in a, an acute care hospital, did you tell me? I was working at a long-term acute care hospital, or we also know them as LTEX. Um, and when I was, I've been working, I was working there for over a year. And it wasn't until February when we started having some of our patients test positive for COVID. Um, but I was working there um, since last year, May. I was still a nursing student. Then I graduated in December. And when I graduated in December, I went back to work as a CNA just to get, you know, just to make some extra money while I was waiting to take the NCLEX and while I waited for, you know, job interviews and job offers. But um, yes, I was working as a CNA. Um, I didn't have direct contact with the COVID patients because there was few uh, at my hospital, there was like five. And so since the cases were like, the, the amount of cases was low. They just um, did like one-to-one -one patient to nurse ratio. So the nurse had one patient and she did like the full care for that patient during the shift in order to minimize the CNAs and other nurses from getting exposed and them exposing the other patients on the other floors as well. But I do remember, you know, coming in one day and, you know, we had patients already tested positive. I remember my coworkers just, you know, freaking out. Some of them refusing to come in. Some of them um, just not wanting to, um, you know, deal with the, the COVID patients for fear of, you know, at that time in February, February we didn't really know a lot. You know, we didn't know how it was like transmitted. I feel like now we know a little bit more, but still things are changing. And at that time, there was just this like massive hysteria about like, what if and like what happens? And, you know, obviously everyone has that right, especially if they have family members that they could go and, you know, possibly get infected. And so I just remember a lot of my workers, you know, being scared. Um, and then like towards the rest of the months that I was working there up until April, that's when I finally left my job as a CNA. Um, I remember just getting fitted for ma for one mask, for an N95 mask. And I was given a mask just for like basically the whole, my whole time there. I wasn't allowed to like keep grabbing another one. I had one N95 mask and I could only get another one if my old N95 mask was like visibly soiled. That's when we could like get another one. And I remember just like after a few days of like wearing it, you know, the it gets loose. It starts getting loose. It has like a certain smell, you know, you're putting it in a bag after your shift and then you're leaving it in your locker. And I just remember thinking like, you know, this is really happening. Um, I also remember um, one of my coworkers texting me and she was telling me that prior to our hospital restricting visitors, we were still getting visitors and you know news was breaking out about coronavirus being in the U.S. and she said that she texted me and she said you know she was like our family members are stealing our masks that we have in the hallway they're taking the boxes and taking them home with them and she told me that you know, she's like, I had to report it. She's like, I had to report it to our managers because it's not fair, you know, for us. We're the ones that are working. And, you know, she caught families coming in to visit their loved ones and they were taking our, our PPE <laughs> early on and 
early on in like you know this whole pandemic thing and I was like what no way she's like yeah she's like I saw them she's like because prior to this we just had our gloves and masks just lined up outside of every room you know in case you needed one you didn't always wear a mask in the hospital before you would only use one if you know that patient had the flu or if that patient had tv right you but they were still there just in case and then when that incident happened where you know family members started stealing the boxes of masks um our managers had to lock away everything and then they restricted visitors and then when you came in for your shift you had to go to the manager's office and she would give you a mask um, and you were only given like a mask for like the whole week you know then towards like April when things were starting to get a little worse at my hospital like we had more COVID patients and um, we were running out of gowns you know we worked 12-hour shifts and um, everyone was on was on like special respiratory precautions. Everyone was getting tested now for COVID. And until the results came back, you had to treat everyone like they had COVID. So then you have like 40, 30 to 40 patients on one floor. And now you have to wear a different gown every time you go into the rooms. And so you're wasting so much gowns, right? Cause you're not allowed to reuse them. A lot of people didn't want to reuse them. And then by the end of the shift, by the end of like 7 p.m., there was no more gowns, you know. Night shift would come in and they would be, you know, upset. They were like, where are the gowns? Um, why hasn't management brought up more gowns? Like they're aware that we're, we're using so many gowns and it was frustrating. I could understand that. And then at one point we were also out of bleach wipes and then they had to start like making their own bleach wipes <laughs> and you know it was just like it was like it was still scary for me and I just I at that time I was living with my grandma and I just didn't feel comfortable anymore uh, going to work there and coming back just because, you know, my grandma is like a 72 year old lady. I didn't feel comfortable um, coming back and, because I wanted a protector and I just didn't want that, you know, if anything happened, I didn't want that to fall on me, but. Where was the facility located? Um, can I not say? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, but in, in Illinois. Yeah, in Illinois, yes. In Illinois. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so then, uh, starting in March, uh, you became a registered nurse. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the transition from CNA to RN? Did COVID affect your becoming an RN? Were there educational challenges at the time due to that? So, becoming our, a in our end, um, the process was smooth, right? I graduated in December, um, but before becoming a, a registered nurse, you need to get your license, and so you need to take the NCLEX, and it's this huge exam that everyone takes in the U.S., and you need to pass before you become officially a licensed registered nurse before you're legally able to practice in your home state, right? So, you know, I graduated in December, December 15, 2019. And, you know, I took a couple weeks off. I knew this big exam was like in the back of my head. I knew I had to take this exam before I could do anything or proceed to do anything. But I took a few weeks off, you know, the holidays came and I just wanted to relax with my family. Then finally, in um, January, I started to, you know, um, pick a date you have to pick a date in the testing center to take the exam and at that time it was still easy to pick a date and a testing center i picked a date for february i picked for whatever was available you know and soon enough february came and i went and took my test 
two days later, I, um, you know, I found that I passed. And when I took my test, you know, there weren't any restrictions. This was February 17th, right? There was already confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the U.S., but restrictions weren't in place like they are now. I went to a room where we were all in little cubicles. No one was wearing a mask. We were all far apart from each other, but it was more for, you know, privacy reasons and testing reasons rather than safety reasons, right? Um, so in terms of me getting uh, testing and signing up, like I was still able to, you know, deal with that process very easy. Um, then I finally found out, you know, I finally passed. I got my license. It took a couple of weeks towards like the end of February, early March. I finally got my license from the state of Illinois. And that's when I finally like felt ready to apply for jobs because I felt like, you know, now was the time. I didn't want that burden of like applying for jobs to linger on top of like that stress of studying for this really important exam, right? So I just took things one by one. But then once I started applying for jobs, I actually, um, it was hard to find a job. You know, I thought I was gonna, it was gonna be easy to find a job. I started applying for jobs in March. By March, you know, after St. Patrick's Day, I remember Governor Pritzker shutting down everything, you know, all the restaurants, gyms, um, theaters. That's when Governor Pritzker put in like restrictions, like official restrictions. And that's when I started to realize like, oh, like, you know, this is for real, this is real. And every day on the news, I started, I would watch the news and every day, Illinois and every day Chicago had more cases and the cases kept increasing, you know, and um, because of that, I thought, you know, of course they need more nurses. Of course, they're going to want to hire me, but it was actually difficult to find a job. Um, I kept applying every day to jobs because I felt ready to, you know, go in and work on the front lines. But a lot of the messages that I kept getting from hospitals after I submitted my applications were, were, they weren't offers and they weren't rejections. They were more like, if I can read it to you, I have the email here. It sure. says, you know, we apologize. And as we continue to evaluate, evaluate and predict staffing needs for our future surge levels due to COVID-19, it, it is evident our focus needs to be on roles that will help us care for and move patients safely through our system. Therefore, this position, you know, position that I applied to has been closed and we put all our recruitment efforts into patient facing positions. And so, when I would get that email, I would be like, I don't understand because you're closing this position you put up online, but then you're also saying, you know, you need more, you need to open up more units for, for more, for more patients, therefore you need more nurses. And so it was, it was just like a confusing time. I wasn't sure if I was getting rejected or what. And then at a lot of places, I was hearing from my other nursing friends and from just other, other nurses too. They were saying that some places were shutting down, especially uh, surgeries were getting shut down now. Um, I heard that a lot of nurses got fur furloughed as well. And so that's when um, I started realizing like, oh, like it's not gonna be easy then to find a job, even though everyone keeps telling me we need more nurses, right? Um, another one of the emails that I got after I submitted an application for just like a, regu a, a regular medical surgical nurse position, um, I got an email from that hospital and it said, thank you for submitting your recent application to health system. 
Given the COVID-19 situation, our priority has been focused on patient care activities. Therefore, we thank you again for your interest and ask for your patience as we continue to navigate the uncertainty of this current situation. So these were the kinds of emails that I was getting in March and April. And it wasn't like a rejection, it was just asking me to be patient, right? <laughs> Until they figure out <laughs> this whole COVID thing. And it was frustrating as a new graduate nurse, because as a new graduate nurse, you want to go and help and be in the front lines, right? You think you're ready, you want to, you just want to jump in. And then everyone else is telling you, don't worry, you'll get a job, like they need you, they need nurses. And, but in fact, that wasn't my reality. It wasn't until April, late April, that I finally got a call back from one hospital. And, um, you know, we went through the process of interviewing. It took about a month to get everything settled in, just to, uh, to submit everything, all the paperwork, the background check, you know, the drug screening. And then I started over like a month ago. But um, um, it was just like so frustrating the whole time, you know, and in the meantime, I'm watching the news, I'm reading the news that we have more cases in Illinois, you know, we have more people dying and it, I just, it was definitely not what I expected. Um, and then now I have, I have one friend who, um, I have a couple friends that graduated from nursing school in May. And now they're dealing with this thing where they can't even like get a testing date, get a testing center, because most testing centers, you know, are limiting the amount of the amount of people that can go in and take the NCLEX. Um, one of my friends, she's my coworker now, um, she said she graduated in February 2020, and she said she couldn't test until like April. She said when she um, went online to log in and pick a date and a testing center, she was able to, but then a couple weeks later, the testing center canceled that for her. And so she was just, she had to reschedule multiple times her testing date just to like sit and take the NCLEX. And then she, when me and her talked and we met at work, you know, she said she, she went through the same thing. She was like, yeah, I was constantly applying and I just kept getting these emails saying, thank you for your patience. Like we are, we're figuring out this COVID situation, kind of like, we'll let you know if we need you type of thing. And we were just like, so perplexed by like this, you know. <laughs> the situation because we were like thinking why why um you know if they need nurses why aren't they hiring us right but I know for a new grad it takes time you have to get um you have to get trained and maybe they I'm pretty sure they needed nurses that were they are, that already had experience right in order to jump in already and deal with like the the COVID cases so you did get a job. Tell us about your, your duties there and, your, and the job that you're currently working in. So I got hired for an, I got hired at um, an oncology slash medical surgical unit. So my unit is a 20 bed unit, private room um, floor. And all of our cases are mostly oncology patients. So patients with cancer who get admitted and um, need, um, you know, it's their first time getting chemotherapy, so they need to come into the hospital and they're getting chemotherapy for, for 24 hours, so they need to be monitored constantly, right? Uh, we also get a lot of patients that are post-op, like after surgery, but because of COVID, you know, a lot of surgeries were canceled. And, you know, hospitals were losing money too from that. Um, 
nurses that were that are you know scrub nurses or surgical nurses were also getting furloughed or getting floated to other units while you know surgeries were completely canceled so my unit was specific it's specifically for oncology patients however when i got hired my manager told me she was like our unit because it's private rooms um, our unit was chosen to be turned into a COVID floor. And she asked me during an interview, she was like, how comfortable do you feel working with COVID patients? And, you know, I was like, it's okay as long as, you know, we have the proper equipment. And sure enough, like my first day on the floor, my unit was still COVID. We had about maybe 16 COVID patients. Um, but my floor had the COVID patients that were pretty stable. They weren't super like critical that they needed to be in the ICU. They just needed constant monitoring because they were, um, they were, they couldn't breathe on their own. They needed oxygen. Um, they also had other like medical diagnoses that like increased the risk, you know, um, of possible complications. So they needed like constant monitoring. They couldn't just be discharged and go home to self quarantine. So those were the kinds of patients I've been dealing with. Um, and, you know, it's been it's been interesting. A lot of issues, different issues that I didn't think about until now have a like have arised you know um but it's been an interesting experience do you feel like you were prepared for the covid aspect with your training <laughs> or was it you had to learn on the spot i feel like i had to learn um some of the things i you know learned from school um other things i learned on the floor um but I think you just learn as you go and each patient is different and each patient has like a different, you know, situation. So it's not just even that it's, it's thing, it's little things like, for example, the other day I had a patient who was COVID positive. He was uh, admitted because of um, dehydration. You know, he came from home, he needed, he needed he needed fluid replacements and he also had like an altered mental status where um his family was concerned about his safety and so you know he had to be admitted once we resolved the issue of dehydration you know the doctor was like you know he could go home he can go and self-quarantine and so sure enough like around six six 6 p.m., 6.30, you know, I get the order for the discharge. But the thing is, um, you know, this is like a 67-year-old man who's living with his 90-year-old mother. His 90-year-old mother is his power of, a ter of attorney. You know, um, his daughter is out of state. And so I'm left with this thing of like, how can I get him home? Who can pick him up? Because, um, you know, we use a service where some of our patients can get transported through ambulance back home, but that's only if they can't walk or if they, they need to be transported with a stretcher, you know, and um, other like med, med cars, aren't transporting positive COVID positive patients home. You know, they're refusing to transfer them home. And so I was left with this issue of like, how am I gonna get him home? You know, no one can pick him up. I called his sis I called his niece. I was like, you know, is it possible for you to pick him up? And she was like, I don't want to pick him up. She's like, he's COVID positive. <laughs> you know, I I am she's like, you know, I don't want to expose myself to that. She's like, let me see if maybe like someone else from our family can pick him up and take him home. 
And, you know, it was this back and forth with the family of, like, who can pick him up? At the end, some one of the family members was like, could you order him a cab, you know? And I was like, well, I don't know if I can order him a cab. You know, I don't know if cabs are transporting any, I don't know if cabs or taxis are transporting COVID positive patients, right? And I was, it was like a situation that I didn't even know existed or could have existed until like, I was experiencing it, you know? So simple things of like transporting patients now. COVID has changed that completely too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Tell us about the hospital that you work at and the patients in the community. So uh, I work in the in this hospital that's on the south side of Illinois, closer to Indiana. Um, and majority of the population near that area and that community that the hospital serves is African American, um, low income, also Hispanic, and also uh, white. Um, but majority of my patients, a lot of them are African American, and they come from low income backgrounds. And you know, not not only do they need medical assistance, but they also need like placement or assistance, like other kinds of assistance. Um, the other day, I had a patient who was COVID positive, came back, came came to the to our hospital because you know he was suffering a schizophrenic episode he doesn't live at home he lives in an assisted living facility right but he's covid positive and so he got admitted to my covid floor and um he was completely stable you know other than the once we we calmed him down we did what we had to do you know we he's still there because he's COVID positive. The assisted living facility where he came from doesn't want him back because apparently he's still aggressive, you know, and he can't go anywhere else because he's still COVID positive. So he's just been there on our floor for like more than two weeks, you know? And he's asking like, like, why am I still here? Like, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I just had a, an episode, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of a lot of facilities are are requiring that patients are negative, and until they're ne until they're negative, until they test negative, we can't move them out of the hospital. They're just sitting there, and you know, it's a uh, it's disheartening because. You know, he's asking me, he's like, when am I going to leave? You know, when am I going back? And I'm like, well, first of all, um, you know, the assisted facility where you came from does not, you know, doesn't want you back, you know, because you're saying you're aggressive. So now I'm working with um, case management and social services to find a new placement for you, you know, and a lot of these places ask for like the history of the patient. Then they also ask like, are they COVID pos positive? Because if they're COVID positive, well, we're not taking any right now. And then some are, and it's just like a whole back and forth ordeal again. So that's an example of a patient that probably yeah. never would have been hospitalized in the first place, except for COVID. And yeah. then once he was hospitalized, he couldn't go back to <laughs> where he came from. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I've, I've been seeing that a lot and, you know, I never thought about that, about that happening until, you know, until this patient, you know, then I have, um, then I have one patient who refused to have the COVID test done in the ER and, but he was complaining of chest pain and, you know, um, his like cardiac enzyme levels were elevated. And so they wanted to rule out like a heart attack, but, beca but because he, um, he refused to have the COVID swab, you know, that uncomfortable swab, um, they put him on my floor. 
And then now we have to treat him like he has COVID, but we don't know if he has it because he refused to take to have the swab done. And so then now we're having this conversation with my coworkers and we're like, why are they bringing possible negative COVID people on our floor and then have them get exposed to COVID now? You know? Mm. And it, it's just, um, that's just what I've been experiencing. I've been experiencing some patients that are like, rule out COVID. We don't know. Um, we don't know if they're truly COVID uh, because there's two different t- kinds, of, kinds of tests that you can do. And some of them say they're negative. Some, some say they're positive. But then meanwhile, they're on my floor. And if they aren't positive, then they're getting exposed because they're remaining on my floor. Do you feel safe there yourself? You mentioned some PPE problems at your previous employer. How, how's the situation where you're working now? Oh, it's great. We have a lot of PPE. They ha- there has been policies um, put into practice where um, they require all nurses to be you know, completely um, to, com- to use everything from goggles to face shields to N95s to surgical masks to gowns and gloves, hair nets, shoe coverings. We have everything. And um, we're also provided with surgical scrubs. So when I come in, I change out of my regular uniform and I put on surgical scrubs and then I wear those for the rest of my shift. Then when I'm done, I take it off, I put it in a bin and then the hospital obviously cleans those scrubs and I get to go home wearing my, my, my clean scrubs. And so I do feel pretty um, good there. I feel protected. And a lot of my coworkers, um, you know, they tell me, they're like, I've been working on this COVID floor for like four or five months. And they're like, and I'm fine, you know? They're good. They haven't had like a lot of people that have tested positive and then have to like leave work a lot of them have been working there have been on the COVID floor for like these last four months and they're like I feel great I feel fine you know we get monitored we have to get tested and so I do feel comfortable and I do feel like um there's protection where I'm at good yeah have you faced any challenges as a Latina healthcare professional um, working in maybe a different environment than 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 you were used to in terms of the patient population? Mm, so far, no. Just because I think the hospital where I work is is pretty diverse. There's a lot of um there's a lot of African American nurses. There's a lot of um Hispanic nurses, you know, Asian nurses, just nurses from different backgrounds, and they've all been very welcoming. And there's like this solidarity that exists within us that has made it easier. And I actually love working with the population that I do um, because I've ha- I've been able to interact with a lot of Hispanic patients, a lot of Hispanic um, COVID positive patients, and it's been great because, you know, they, they light up when they see me and I can talk to them in Spanish, you know. They light up when I come into the morning and I introduce myself to them and I tell them I'm going to be your nurse today in Spanish, you know. And I think I'm also like a pretty good resource on my floor because, um, you know, say they need like a little bit of like interpreting or need like just something where they have difficulty communicating with their patient and I'm not their nurse they'll call me and be like Betsy can you just tell her this and you know I do it because you know I want to be a resource to them so it's but 
in terms of like Hispanic, you know, me being Hispanic, I, I was scared of like, you know, feeling left out or feeling out of place or feeling like I was going to be, um, how do I say, underestimated, but that's, that hasn't been the case. So you had mentioned you're working with a new COVID treatment that they're trying to develop. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Um, so I know a little bit of, of it too, but um, it's this um, it's this drug called Rundesivir, and I've seen it a lot on our floor, and um, it's you know I also saw this article saying that. It, it costs very little to make it, but I also saw that, you know, they're charging about $2,500 per treatment. And so I was just alarmed because you get this treatment for four days, four to five days, and it's to help, supposed to help fight the virus. And I was concerned because I was like, a lot of my patients are Hispanic and African American, and they're coming from this community where, you know, there's food deserts and, um, you know, there's, um, there's not enough resources. And I was just concerned with, like, they're getting charged for this, you know, they're getting charged for this very expensive treatment and it's supposed to be super cheap to make. And so I had this conversation with my, with one of my friends who works at a lab. And she said that, you know, I should advocate for my patients and let them know that they should ask for um, bill statements where they break down everything that they're getting charged for because that way you know they know exactly what they're getting charged for at the end of their stay and could it could ho possibly help you know with those extra charges and I you know I was just it was just something I read online I forgot the article and um, but when I saw that they were charging like 2500 for this little bag of treatment, you know, and they're supposed to get it for four days. I was like, four to five days, that's like what? Like maybe 10 grand maybe? And I was like, that's a lot of money, you know? And, but these people are, they're in a situation where they, you know, they need this treatment. And I just wish there was more, it wasn't such a business. You know, I, w I just wish sometimes healthcare wasn't such a business. But unfortunately, it is. We had heard at one point that uh, people that were being treated for COVID-19 wouldn't, wouldn't have to worry about paying for their treatment. But is that, is that your experience? Or is the remdesivir a separate kind of a thing other than just the treatment? I don't know. To be honest, I'm not sure. Um, Are patients concerned about what it's going to be costing them to be in the hospital that long? Yeah. I um, I had one of my patients ask me, you know, I admitted her that one day and then by the end of my shift, she was asking me, she's like, when could I go home? She's like, I don't want to be here. Like, I want to go home. And I was asking her, you know, like, well, you're not breathing well on your own. I was like, you're short of breath every time you get up. I'm like, you need to be monitored. Your oxygen level needs to be monitored. I was like, but why do you feel like you need to go home? And, you know, she was just saying that, like, she self-pay, doesn't have insurance. And she said she'd just rather, you know, self-quarantine at home. You know, and so I have seen some patients get scared when they're admitted. They're, they might be, they're scared about possibly getting worse. They're scared about, you know, what, how they're going to pay for after, especially if they're self-pay, if, especially if they don't have insurance. I had um, one patient get um, admitted and he left AMA because he didn't want to be there. He said he had to work. 
And so it was like a very difficult situation um, watching him leave because, you know, he was picking his job and his livelihood over getting treatment, you know, and it was, I, you know, once they do that, once they say they want to leave AMA, you know, we can't really f prevent that. What is that AMA? What does that stand uh, for? Against medical advice. Okay. Yeah. That's hard to see as a health healthcare professional. Yeah. To see someone have to make that decision. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking with my coworker and the doctor. The doctor was like, I don't want him to leave, but he's like, I understand his situation that if he works in construction and if he doesn't show up, he could lose his job. He could lose his, he could lose his only job. And my patient was telling me, he's like, I work in construction. He's like, if I don't show up to work today in the afternoon, that's it. He's like, I don't have any other form of income. Um, he's like, he said, he said, he said, I'm going to get kicked out from where I live. If I don't pay my rent, my phone bill is going to get, is due. It's going to get canceled. I won't have a way of communicating. He said, and I'm going to be homeless again. And it was, it was hard. I was like, but do you understand though, that you need help? You know, you're not feeling well and you need to be monitored and you need to be admitted. And he was like, no, I can't. I'll be fine. Like, I just, I'll just go home. And if I, you know, he's like, and if I feel worse, I'll come back. And so it, it was this difficult situation of him, like, picking between his, like, his health and then his livelihood. And I, I wanted him to understand that, you know, you can't have a livelihood without a life, you know. But he was very much, like, adamant about leaving and going to work unfortunately. <laughs> Any other stories from your frontline work that you'd want to share? Hospital? Um, I had another one where it was very frustrating a couple weeks ago. Um, my patient had a history of liver cancer and colon cancer. He was also ended up, he also ended up testing COVID positive um, after his mother tested COVID positive. And so, you know, these cancer patients, their, their immune systems are compromised, especially after chemotherapy. And so um, he had to get admitted in order, in order to be like observed and monitored. Um, and additionally, like additionally, he also had um, a hemorrhoid that was an external hemorrhoid that was very bothersome and very painful. And so, you know, the plan was to get him to have surgery once he tested COVID negative, once he was negative. Eventually, he tested negative three times. And that's when we were like, okay, like you're going to be good to get this, you know, this hemorrhoidectomy, this, this surgery, you know, this, the surgeon, the PA came to talk to him. They took a look at his hemorrhoid and, um, they told him, yeah, for sure. Tomorrow you'll go down for your surgery. We just need another rapid swab to make sure you are still COVID negative. And, you know, we had, prepared him for surgery we had got the consent and everything he was super excited because he said that hemorrhoid was just very painful right super painful and he just wanted to get it done but then the next day when I come back for work um the OR nurse charge nurse calls me and she's like you know Betsy um the surgeon says that you know he's not going to do it until we are for sure positive that he's COVID negative. Um, so we're going to postpone the surgery until we get another, another swab. And um, it was frustrating because he was such a sweet guy, super understanding, but I had to be like the the messenger of bad news, you know, and he had already been on my unit, on my COVID unit, just sitting there waiting, just 
there waiting for the surgery to happen. And I've been seeing that a lot with surgeries and procedures. Um, COVID changed a lot of the it changed a lot of things like in terms of like how we go about with procedures you don't just send your patients down anymore um like colonoscopies any surgery stuff like that where anesthesia is required um the they need like two to three negative swabs in order for them to even go down to the procedure and then in the meantime they're just waiting and you know, it's very frustrating, especially once, you know, you know, you're COVID negative, but then you have the surgeon or the anesthesiologist refusing to still do the surgery, you know, and for me, it was even more frustrating because um, the surgeon, the surgeon didn't come up and tell the patient personally. I had to be like the bearer of bad news like twice, but the guy was super sweet. He was very understanding and, you know, he thanked me for everything. And I just, you know, that waiting, it's like COVID puts like this pause on so many things. And I think it's not just like in the healthcare field. I feel like it put a pause on a lot of people's lives. Right. But that's just been my experience. It sounds like there's not, even where there is testing, there's not a high confidence in the results of tests either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I understand, do I get it? Like if you're gonna give, um, you know, if you're gonna be so close to someone's face, you wanna make sure that <laughs> they're negative, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But. So let's talk about your family. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about your, your boyfriend's experience with COVID and his family. Um, so I I would rather not <laughs> okay. speak about it if that's okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. About um, how about in general how the crisis has affected your family's routines? So when everything started happening, you know, when there was more, the when when there was confirmed cases of COVID nineteen in the U.S., um, I remember you know everyone was freaking out. I'm pretty sure you remember this too on the news everyone was like having fights over like toilet paper and like you know um toiletries paper towels water you know i remember seeing all these stories on online and on the news about you know people just wiping shelves off everyone there was like this huge mass hysteria about like what was going to happen and i remember one time my mom getting home from from grocery shopping and you know she was like I'm just gonna do the grocery shopping that I normally do she said because we don't have you know money like that to hoard and buy in excess and in bulk you know and I remember her telling me that day that weekend on one Saturday morning she was like you know she's like I couldn't find water she said, I had to go to five different stores to find water, you know, water bottles. And um, she said it was very frustrating. And then when she finally got to, a, you know, a jewel and found water, she said it was like overpriced. You know, people were, were putting those 24, 32 packs of water for like, seven dollars eight dollars you know when she would usually be able to get it for like two three dollars and so we didn't have that luxury or like that of being able to hoard or or buy in bulk just because we didn't have um uh money like that but and we were also very like conflicted like i remember feeling so super like conflicted about letting my mom go to work you know my mom works in a factory um she's a, an assembly line worker um and i was like i don't want my mom to go to work you know because we don't know how this is how this virus is transmitted i don't know what if maybe her workers are positive and they don't know and then they 
you know, they, my mom gets it. it we were, I was so stuck between like letting my mom go to work and working because I also knew that, you know, we don't have any other source of income, you know, other than us working. Like a majority of my family is undocumented. Almost all of it is undocumented. And they've been here in the U.S. for like more than 10 years. And so, but they still don't qualify for any like financial assistance. Um, none of us got like the stimulus check. And then um, none of us qualify for like the unemployment. And so we were all very like, I remember just sitting one day, like eating dinner and watching the news and like hearing that a lot of people were getting laid off. And we were kind of like, like we want to get laid off, but then we don't because if we get laid off, then we don't have a source of income. But then if we do work, then we risk, we increase that risk of getting infected. And it was so, such a dilemma for us. But um, but fortunately, all of us have been able to work and keep our jobs. And um, we've all just followed, you know, just followed precautions. Um, we haven't, we don't go out. It, like when everything started, we wouldn't go out as much. You know, it was more just grocery store to home. We started limiting, like ordering out food. And then my mom just started, you know, just taking precautions, like wearing a mask to work, um, buying hand, you know, buying hand sanitizer, whatever she could. Um, and so far, you know, we've all been pretty, we've all been healthy. None of us have tested positive and all of us have gone out, have been outside to work. You know, none of us have been able to stay and work from home, but, Fortunately, we've all been, we've, none of us have tested positive. And I remember just in February thinking like, what's gonna happen if my mom keeps working? You know, if I keep working, like eventually one of us is gonna test positive, you know? But then I was like, but we can't stop working because we don't have any other assistance. You know, my mom said, my mom was like, if we stop working, she's like, we're gonna die of hunger because we don't have, you know, we don't have a savings. We, we, we didn't get the stimulus check. We can't, we can't like file for unemployment either. Um, so it was just so, it was like, it just made things so much harder for us. Um, but fortunately, we're all good. <laughs> does, how does your mom feel about where she works? Have they been, have they been supportive with masks or se uh, ice separation, stuff like that? So my mom, it's interesting, her, her job, her job um, ended up closing for two weeks in order to sanitize and clean everything. Um, unfortunately, she didn't get paid during those two weeks, um, but um, they were pretty good at like responding and monitoring their their em like their employees. She said that right away they gave everyone masks and homemade masks. They had their employer their employees one of their employees a lady like sew masks for everyone. And so my mom one day came home with a bunch of like homemade masks and she was super happy <laughs> and then after they closed their factory for two weeks you know they let they kind of cleaned everything out they she said that um her her boss you know instituted new measures where like they had their temperature checked before going to work they had like hand sanitizer at like every station of the factory and then interesting enough um they reached out to my mom and they asked they changed her position they asked her if she could um become one of the you know one of the like environmental services person where she would clean so now she went from like working on the assembly line to now cleaning everything so she spends all her days like cleaning, cleaning the offices, the bathrooms, sanitizing everything for everyone. And so they opened up that position specifically for her. So she's been kind of like on that front line too, where, you know, 
they're cleaning. She's cleaning everything after everyone, sanitizing everything, bathrooms. She comes home and she tells me, you know, she's always um, cleaning the door handles, any any surfaces. Um, her her boss basically just implemented and opened up the position and created a position so they could have, you know, um, like more sanitation. So, um, but yeah, she likes it. She thinks it's cool that she's doing that now. But I just, you know, um, and I'm grateful. I'm happy that they're doing that That because it, it seems like they care and they want to, you know, make sure everyone stays safe. Have they had any cases there? My mom said that, yes, a lot of her coworkers have tested positive, but she said that um, they're required to notify their employer and then they have to go home and self quarantine. Is it the employer that's doing the testing that they're finding that out? No. Um, a lot of, I don't know, honestly, I just know that she said that like a couple of her employers have a couple of her coworkers have tested positive, like their family members had it, like their spouse had it. And then, and even if their spouse has it, their employer has, um, has asked them to just stay home instead. Right. Yeah. Why did you decide to become a healthcare professional? Um, I think because of my experience with the healthcare system. Like I said earlier, a lot of my family is undocumented and um, with that, they don't have health care insurance. They don't. They they can't get health care insurance. And so I remember growing up, if something happened, um, we had to go to the ER for anything. And I remember going to the ER with my family members, and they would ask me to come with them, in order to interpret for them. And so here I am, like twelve year old me, thirteen year old me, trying to interpret and talk to talk for them with the nurse you know or with the secretary and um i i was just like you know this is sad like <laughs> i don't want you know i remember my family members being scared to even go to the er they would wait until like they were really like literally like sick and then we would rush to the er right and i don't know i just wanted to I wanted to use like my, the fact that I speak Spanish and be able to advocate for those patients. Um, I think it's, it's awesome when I get like my Hispanic patients and I can talk to them in Spanish and like you can tell that they're super grateful and super happy that there's someone in this hospital that speaks Spanish and can kind of understand them and how they feel because I feel like within the Latino community we don't really um, use hospitals like that you know we wait until like everything is super like serious at least for my family we use a lot of like home remedies and like herbal herbal teas and all of that they don't really believe in like you know like the healthcare system and I just wanted to be more of like an advocate and that's why I chose to be a nurse because I think that as a nurse like I can be an advocate for those patients once they are admitted, once they're on the floor. Um, and also when I was growing up, I remember all of my interactions were with nurses, were with nurse practitioners. You know, my mom would take me to my yearly physicals. My mom would take me to my yearly immunizations and all of them were nurses. You know, all the care, the direct care I got was from nurses and 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 some of them, when they spoke Spanish, it was great because it felt like my mom felt more comfortable. My mom was able to be understood too. This is a period in our history where not only has this pandemic taken center stage, but also social activism mm -hmm. with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and other uh, demonstrations. Can you talk a little bit about your previous activism and then we'll talk about what about currently if you're involved in anything. 
So in college, I was part of Dream Action. Um, so it's uh, an organization at NIU that advocates for like the undocumented community. They bring more awareness about the issues undocumented students are facing, especially in terms of like reaching that higher education. And so my freshman year, you know, I really reached out to that group because I came in and I, I you know, I'm undocumented. I'm undocumented myself, and so getting to a, a four-year um, four-year institution was hard, and like finding money to pay for that was difficult. And so, Dream Action has really helped out not just me, but like so many people in terms of like finding resources to pay for that. And like I was um, active during my freshman and sophomore year, and it was great because I got to meet a lot of other. Um, undocumented students that I felt like really understood my situation, you know, understood what I was going through, um, that uncertainty of like, what's going to happen if, you know, DACA gets removed, like what's going to happen if, you know, um, I can't pay for this semester because majority of my, my school was paid out of pocket and through scholarships. Um, and so we were able to like, you know, meet with like the president of NIU, with like um, state representatives. We were able to host um, coming out of the shadows on campus where we highlighted like undocumented students and their stories and, you know, the, the barriers they faced in order to bring more awareness of undocumented students on campus. And I also liked that they, um, we really highlighted that, you know, this uh, immigration issue is not just like Latino centered, but it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, from other countries, you know, I met people that were undocumented and they were from other countries from Asia, from, you know, um, from Eastern Europe, too, you know, and it was really cool um, working with them. And it really also just, it was good for my growth because I was able to accept, you know, my undocumented status and be unapologetic about it. You know, I, I think when I finally re met with the people from Dream Action, that was when I finally realized that there was like nothing wrong with being undocumented, you know? I, I realized that it wasn't my fault, you know? My, there was nothing to be ashamed about. And um, Dream Action, um, w you know, highlights that immigration was is also like a black issue as well, and that there should be solidarity between, you know, blacks and his and Latinos, right? Because it's not just Latinos that are affected by immigration; it's them too. How about right now? Um, well, first of all, that probably having that background helped you your current situation dealing with a variety of people, you know, that aren't, that aren't just like you. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the Black Lives Matter and the demonstrations and stuff that it, that's been going on now, have you been able to participate in that at all? Unfortunately, I have not. Um, I remember when, you know, the, the protests started, especially after George Floyd's death. Um, I remember I was, getting ready for um, for work. And a lot of the protests that occurred were like during my time when I was working. And then I also felt, um, I also felt, you know, I had to be careful about what I said because of my position as like a, a healthcare worker, you know? I, I was stuck in this weird, situation where you know I just didn't want my co-workers to think that I was like anti-white you know <laughs> and so it's been um, difficult but we've had these conversations at work and you know when when some of my co-workers you know try to say you know say something you know I I listen and I try to educate them you know especially because a lot of our a lot of our patients are black, you know, and I think it's, you know, there's been this history of, 
you know, black people not being listened to or being paid attention to in the healthcare system. And I think that in my position, I have to advocate for them. It's best, especially given like the history of, you know, black women dying more, you know, black women, you know, um, black women, they show different signs of having a heart attack, you know, they're not the same signs as like a white male, you know, and so just me learning more about that and how I can advocate, like, that's what I've kind of been doing more, like, just educating myself more and learning more about the history of like discrimination uh, with um, blacks in the healthcare system. And how's that working out with the, your conversations with coworkers that may may not have the same perspective? Well, so far, um, a lot of my coworkers have been receptive and um, they're very aware about what's going on. And I, and, um, and I think also it kind of helps because they're young, like, they're not like, I don't want to say they're like old, but they're like within my age, you know, they're like 25, 28. So I think because of that, they're also more open minded to learning more and becoming more aware of the things we can do to be better advocates as nurses. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with me about your experiences with COVID-19 that we haven't talked about? Um, no, that's it. I just wanted to talk a little bit about like my family and how for us, it was just a little bit of this moment of more uncertainty, way more uncertainty. And we were stuck between this huge, we're like, should we work? Should we not work? you know, but we can't get any assistance. We don't qualify for any assistance. And I just wish people like would understand that, you know, that COVID literally did, um, like I said, it put a pause on things. It also, it highlighted more of that uncertainty that we, we have felt in the past, especially um, in relation to our legal status and then me working as a nurse a new nurse you know coming into this there was just a lot of fear and uncertainty um, of whether or not you know I would be able to um, work you know work and get a job and then once I do have a job like will I be good enough you know will I be able to advocate for my patients. And how do you feel now about that? So <laughs> I feel a little bit more comfortable in my role as a nurse, but I still get those, like that anxiety before a shift. That there's this anxiety that still stays with me every time before a shift. But I think that's just like the growing pains that come with being like a, a new nurse. And I, you know, everyone always tells me, you know, your first year is always going to be hard. You know, you're adjusting and there's just so much that you have to do. And so I, I just keep that in the back of my head that, you know, it's not going to be easy peasy right away, you know. Especially during a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really want to thank you, Betsy, for sharing yeah. your experience with us for, and with future scholars and others yeah. uh, to help them understand what it was like experiencing this moment in history. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for even thinking about me. You know, it's, it's a pleasure always talking to you and hopefully, you know, we, there's something we got from this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It get turned out very well. <laughs>